So agave is a plant that fascinated me from a very early age. I was very fortunate to be uh, able to travel with family as a kid out to the desert southwest and was absolutely fascinated by the idea of agaves and, uh, and, and on our, one of those uh, National Lampoon vacation trips was able to bring back some small plants of which we obviously killed. So uh, it wasn't until many years later, um, actually when, we, uh, when I was at NC State, the late Thompson had grown a couple of agaves in the garden and, I was, and they just did absolutely fine. Uh, for those that are uh, native to the area, have been here a long time, we actually do get cold. Uh, last few years, maybe not so much. Uh, for those that were here in 1984, 85, we hit minus nine. Uh, so we, that was our really, really cold. So all the stuff people had brought in that may live for two or three mild winters uh, died. And so as we got older and I began to travel, I was fortunate to get to go back to Mexico. And instead of collecting at the bottom of the mountains, where most of the original agaves had come from, because most of them were originally collected for glass houses in England. And they didn't really care about the hardiness. So we went, instead of collecting at uh, 100 feet elevation, we would go to the top of the mountain at 8,000 feet elevation, and then into Arizona. Because agaves are native from really Utah south, all the way into uh, uh, many cases, uh, certainly uh, Central America. So there's all kinds of ranges of hardiness, but just because you've got a particular species, you need to know if it has a wide range, what that elevation is from. That really does matter, which is why when you buy agaves here, we're pretty particular. We'll tell you this agave is a high elevation collection of plants. Some agaves only grow in a very narrow range. Those, it doesn't matter because it only grows at 4,000 feet. It doesn't grow at five, it doesn't grow at three. Others may grow from 100 feet, as I mentioned, all the way up to 8,000 feet. In that case, it does matter tremendously. We're limited by very, uh, this, there's only a certain number of agaves that will tolerate uh, the temperatures that we have here. Now, agaves have been used for thousands of years. As Patrick will explain tomorrow, it's possibly the longest cultivated plant in humankind. Uh, which is pretty incredible. So what happened is, despite what people think, things, humans were moving stuff around back long before Columbus came here, thousands of years before. So all the, you know, pretty much everybody in America, and I'm going back to a little history now, everybody in America came either across the Pacific Ocean or across the Atlantic Ocean. The first ones came across the Pacific Ocean via the Bering Land Bridge, anywhere between 15 and 30,000 years ago, depending on which researcher you believe. They then went down and south and then came back up. So a lot of the pre-Columbians from Mexico, they would take their favorite agave that they used around their village, and as they moved around, they would always take pieces. And so as they moved back up into what is now North America, they planted their agaves, and their agaves then hybridize with whatever is native. So it's very difficult now to know what constitutes a real wild species and what constitutes a, a pre-Columbian hybrid, as they're now known. As I've hiked through, uh, through Arizona mountains, uh, it's fascinating. You look at plants and like, I don't recognize this. That is what we call pre-Columbian hybrids, and there's been a Really neat book if you're into something like that called uh, Chasing Centuries. Uh, came out last year and it really details a lot of that and documents a lot of those uh, populations. And a lot of those are in fairly mountainous regions and some have some potential winter hardiness here. Agaves range from very large and the largest would be things like uh, Agave Americanus, which is the one you generally see at the beach, which can easily be seven foot tall and 12 foot across. And then yet there are other agaves that are very small that will never get more than a foot tall and a foot wide. So you can pretty much pick any size you want. Agaves, the key to growing them here, several keys. Number one, they hate wet soils in the winter. They're from areas that are bone dry in the winter. We are generally not bone dry in the winter. So you have to find a way to make that soil 
well drained. Two keys. Drainage is both internal and external. So when we build something like this, we're looking at both. External drainage means, does, it, does the water run off? So we just have a little shower. So this is flat. You see the water still there. You will see no water standing on that because it's, it's upright. It runs off. Great external drainage. Internal drainage is what's inside. So this material where we grow our agaves is pretty much 50% as a gravel product called permatil. So these beds are 50% permatil, 25% native soil, which for us is sandy loam, 25% compost. That gives us good internal drainage. If you plant it in straight Raleigh red clay, your internal drainage is not going to be particularly good. So I would again mix the permatil, 25% clay, that's fine, 25% compost. That's a mix we have found experimenting for the last 35 years works extremely well. So the internal drainage is the key. The other way to make sure that your soil is dry in the wintertime is you plant a shrub on the north side that will suck the water out. So that's a common, common especially on the smaller agaves. We always like to plant things that will not shade the plant but will help pull that soil out. In the wintertime, you want things whose roots continue to be active. Evergreen's really nice. The citrus plants will still pull some water, but you want things that will help keep that soil dry. As a general rule, we don't like to use uh, organic mulches around agaves. Uh, they're just too prone to rot. We like to have either a bare soil or a gravelly soil around there to keep the rot because the rain splashes and it splashes dirt up on the leaves and if that stays there and it's very damp you can get some rotting spots in the agaves. Uh, another key in growing agaves, you do not want agaves to be planted late in the year because agaves have to be able to shed water in the winter time. We don't recommend planting an agave in this climate after really August. Anything after August, if you buy an agave, we encourage you to grow it as a container plant through the winter and then plant it out the following spring. Because everything we grow is going to be in a quart pot because we primarily ship agaves. So I would encourage you to put it in a larger pot. Agaves are one of those plants that absolutely grow to the container size. If you have it in a quart pot, you can keep it in there for years and it will stay small. If you put it in a uh, three gallon pot, it will fill that pot in a matter of months. Agaves grow to the pot size. So if you get it in the fall, put it in a larger pot, keep it if you've got a bright sunroom, if not, put it in your garage for the winter. You can keep it not much above freezing. And as long as you're not pushing it with water and fertilizer, it'll just sit there winter in sort of a semi-dormant state and be absolutely fine. Uh, agaves are incredibly, they're one of the toughest plants known to man. Uh, as people who ship agaves all over the world, we often get things hung up in customs disputes, etc. Agaves can sit in a box in a customs office for six months and be absolutely fine. There are very few plants that can tolerate that. So in terms of toughness, they're pretty darn incredible. There are very few pests that bother them. Uh, uh, certainly no deer that had good sense would try to eat an agave. You'd have to be crazy to want to eat those. About the only thing I've ever seen eat them are the jackrabbits of Texas and Arizona. Those things ain't right. Uh, I've seen those actually eat an agave to the ground. So I can't imagine what their teeth look like, but I would, uh, I would certainly hate to encounter them. So let's look at a few agaves. So what you see here, this berm, for those that are not regular, this berm has only been in for just over two years. This did not exist prior to that. So everything here, now some things we moved into here from other areas. Agaves are one of the easiest plants to move. Uh, pretty much any month of the year. Uh, we've moved agaves in December, January, 
I mean, if you move them in January and it gets down to zero, that probably is not going to be good. But they're incredibly easy to move. Uh, they've got a, I would recommend if you decide to move one, cut the spines off, cut everything back except for the tip, and then just dig it and move it. It's quite easy. Don't try to move it intact uh, unless you've got a, a skid steer loader. That would be just crazy. So these, for example, these are some of our hybrids. So what we did once we exhausted species is we got to see the ladder out there in the parking lot. So we get hauling off one, we climb up to the next one, and we create something brand new. So this is an example of one that was created through those hybrids. This is a cross of three different species mixed together. That's what we're doing now. So this one right here, that is a hybrid of two species uh, together. So we're able now to, to almost design the agaves for the size and the form we want. This is not something that really happened in the past. And they vary. So that's a mature size on that. That's the biggest that's going to get. This is one we hybridized for size. So this is used a cross using two of the much larger ones. We anticipate that will probably double or triple in size when it gets mature. Now in the wild, Agaves are called century plants because most of them flower in the wild once every hundred years and then they fall over dead. They live their entire life to have one giant horticultural orgasm and then they fall over dead. That's just... Now, some of them offset. The offsets, the babies are fine. It's like a bromeliad. But some of them never offset. So here's a hybrid, for example, of two non-offsetting species. This is Agave Avatifolia and Agave Victoria Regina. So that one will grow its entire life, never put out a pup, and if we don't do something to force it to offset, that will flower and then die. And that's, that's it, you've lost that clone. So we have, over the years, developed techniques to cause it to offset. So at the base of every leaf on every agave, if you peel that down, there's a tiny little bud in there. And that bud is told, do not grow by the plant hormones. And those are called auxins. And those are generated from the tips here. And it sends a signal, don't grow, don't grow, don't grow. So the only way to make those buds grow is to stop that signaling system. So we came up with a technique where we will actually take a drill and drill the center out. Just take a, a quarter inch drill and just drill all the way down, all the way through the bottom, and the plant looks like hell. It's not something to do if you want your plant to look nice, but if you don't want to lose it, then all of a sudden it'll start offsetting like crazy. And then you can take those offsets and then you've got a lot of plants. So that's, we had to develop a technique because we were spending a lot of money on some new agaves and really didn't want to lose them once they flowered. So there, there are ways to do that. Some people like the solitary ones for design, some like offsetting. So here's another example of one of our hybrids. This is a cross between the agave proto-americana, which is basically what you see mostly at the beach. So we want something big, and then we took agave avatifolia, which is this plant up here. So this is... This is one of the best agaves for this region, if you like a, a fairly large agave. I'm, when I say large, three to four foot tall, seven foot across. But, and those are always blue, so beautiful plant. But we crossed that looking to see how big can we get that. So that could get, that could get huge. That could get, we're anticipating probably four foot by eight foot uh, on that one. Uh, another hybrid here, another hybrid here. So we've really been able to come up with some pretty neat things. It takes years to evaluate, and then once we evaluate, if we decide that we like that, we now have to come in with a big drill and drill the center of that plant out, or either that plant will flower and die. So it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating plant, and it's, it's structurally there's really nothing like an agave. It's, it's, it's incredibly architectural. Now, as much as they hate water in the wintertime, they love water in the summer, like few other plants. 
Agaves grow well. If you have a large container of agave, set it in a tray of water and let it stay waterlogged all summer long. That's contrary to everything you will read and everything you have ever been told. You, it is almost impossible to overwater an agave in the growing months. Now, you can keep the, 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 the crown too wet, but if you water it from the bottom, it is almost impossible. Now, small plants don't do that because they don't have the root system to, to stay that wet. But agaves are absolutely incredible uh, in that regard. Now, again, when they flower, some agave species will flower in three to four years. Uh, some will flower in double that. Some will flower triple that. Agave flowering is based not on age, but on size. So where these grow in the wild, most of them are in the 8 to 12 inches of rain a year. 8 to 12 inches. We are four times that here. Four to six times that. So we can flower a typical agave here in 12 to 15 years from seed. So that's pretty fast. And so what you're seeing up here, in most cases, I think these are in the seven to eight year range because those are some hybrids. Hybrids do things completely different. And also sometimes you have what we call, uh, for lack of a better, we call them uh, blind shoots. So you see these right here. This is from that agave. Now that's not a normal flower shoot. That comes not from the, from the center of the plant, that comes from the roots. So we found that there's one parent, something called agave, we call it Pseudoferox, which is probably an old pre-Columbian hybrid, and it sends off these blind shoots before the plant itself flowers. So the plant has not actually flowered even though the plant flowered. So that will flower probably next year, and that spike will be closer to 20 feet when it does. We love blind shoots because we don't have to get our ladder to climb up to breed them. So if you see those, sometimes it'll send up a half dozen of those and it might start doing that five years before it's actually ready to truly flower. So it's a, it's a very interesting thing. Here's another agave of Atifolia. So we grew a lot from seed because we wanted to see what the diversity is of the genus. So both of these are the same. This one would be about, uh, let's see, 2017. For those looking at our tax, that's six years old. Always below the QR code is the date it was planted in the ground. So that'll help give you an idea of what age. So for six years old, that's that's pretty big. So this will be flowering within another one to seven years. You truly do not know. Uh, the, the idea that you can predict accurately, we've had some of Atifolia's flower seven years, some flower 15 years. It's just each individual is different. It's like humans. Some people flower genetically very early and some are very late flowers. And plants are absolutely the same way. Okay, I think that's a lot of uh, initial stuff. Anybody have any questions about uh, the basic growing of agaves? Practical question, where do you get the gravel? Who where do we get the gravel? Okay, the gravel is a material that we like called permatill. It's, uh, there's only one place in the world that it's close enough to the surface to be mined and that is in Salisbury, North Carolina. And you can buy it. Every garden center should have it now. Uh, every mulch place probably has it. And it's just called permatill. It's a, uh, feel that. It's a, it feels like ground up pumice or lava rock. It's uh, very permeable inside it, so it's full of air. It's also incredibly nutritious. So normal gravel, you think, oh, it's not very nutritious, but this is loaded with nutrients. It also has a very high pH. So agaves, generally in the wild, you see them in alkaline pHs. Generally, any pH is anywhere from 7 to 9. So, uh, and, but now they will grow in the city, not, not 
not low acidic, but pH is a six, six and a half. Agaves are absolutely fine. This has a pH of eight, eight to eight point two. I think that's partly why you can get them to flower earlier. It, it it's all about again size, so good growing conditions. So yes, the soil mix is important, the moisture is important, the light is important. They've got to have full sun. The more light you give them, the better. In the wild, you'll see agaves a lot of times in shade, and the way desert plants work, they've evolved to have what we call nurse plants. They actually will grow underneath something when they're young, and then they crowd out the nurse plant when they're old, like a small tree, kill that off, and then they're in sun when they need it. So agaves have got, they've got just incredible system in the wild for how they work. But the, the, the bigger you can put a plant in, the better. Now, if we plant a plant small, which we plant everything the same size we sell, that's the only just because that's what we do. Uh, if we're seeing we're having a cold winter and we put it in that summer, I will come out in the winter time and get a, uh, uh, you know when you reheat uh, leftovers in an oven, you have like a plastic dome that you put over it to keep the moisture in. We use those for agaves. And there's some really good ones that are about this big. And just in the winter time, if we got something very small, first year, we will just put that over it during the winter time. Now, most of those have a, a little turn knob so that when you reheat leftovers, you can open it to allow the steam out. You want to leave it open. You do not want to leave it closed because all you're trying to do, you're not trying to keep it warm. You're trying to keep the moisture off of it in the winter time because if you keep that thing closed or it's a solid lid, your plant will not survive because you'll cook it because it'll be, you know, double the temperature during the winter. If you had a solid lid, could you just put, put a hole in yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Put several holes in it. Yeah, absolutely. Same thing. But all you're concerned with is keeping the moisture off of them in the wintertime. Uh, there was a, a very famous gardener in the mountains of North Carolina at Whitmore. And first time I went to her garden back in the 70s, this is way the other side of Asheville. She was growing all these agaves. I was like, Ev, how do you do this? How were you able to do this in the mountains? And in the wintertime, what she would do, she would come in, put in four pieces of rebar, lay a piece of plexiglass over top. The sides were open, but she kept the moisture off of them. And it was brilliant. I mean, she was growing them up in a, certainly a cold zone six, and areas you thought. So it's, it's all about the winter moisture. That is that is the key. Is it the winter moisture getting into the crown or is it getting to the roots? Both. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Crown is the is the worst problem, but yes, those roots absolutely so and that's why we tell people to, to plant things early in the year when you come to agaves, because then it'll have time to develop a crown to shed the water off. When it's really small, it doesn't shed. The water then runs right down in there and then right down to the roots and then they're rotted. Mm -hmm. So you're saying to plant uh, before, or not after August, but then you were saying you can move them around mm -hmm. all year round. How, how do those two work together? It's all about being able to shed the water. When you're moving a plant that's older, it's still going to shed the water. You've still got the mass there to shed the moisture. So we have never... We just don't have any problem moving them, whereas planting them late is just a total disaster. So it's, it's all about the size. It's 100%. It's the, so we say it's all about the base. Does it have that base to shed the water off? In the past, you mentioned planting, I thought, planting my slopes. Yes, and that's what we talked about over here. It's that external drainage, and that's why we like the slopes. That's what gives you the external drainage. If you hike in the wild where agaves grow in cold areas you will never see agave growing flat never they all grow on slopes now warm areas that never freeze yeah they don't care they'll grow flat i've seen them growing in in seeps of water but in cold areas you always see them on slopes so it's that external drainage i mentioned 
you know, all the soils out west, not all, but a lot of them have good internal drainage, but they don't have always good external drainage. So the slopes are absolutely the key. So you can see here's an example of something planned to help pull the water away. There is a, uh, an Afghan fig that's never going to get a lot taller, and it doesn't take any sun away, but it's one of those many things that helps pull the moisture out. We've got cacti that help pull the moisture out. We've got over here a leucophyllum that helps pull the moisture out. Not a requirement, but man, that's that extra that makes the difference between that plant surviving a really cold winter or not surviving a really cold winter. Other questions? Ooh. The plant that's over your head that's flowering, is, is that going to die? Right here? Yes. Ah, no, that is a yucca. So that is first cousin to an agave. So agaves and yuccas are both in the same family of asparagus. So asparagus you eat, these are all members of the asparagus family. So when you see a new spike come out, like there's one down there, uh, coming out on the uh, one of the new agaves, you can tell it looks just like uh, an asparagus. So with yuccas, there are yuccas that each rosette dies after flowering, and there are yuccas that don't. So this is one that does not. This one flowers, and it just continues to grow. Whereas this yucca here, this is the one almost everybody grows in their house. Every single rosette, when that flowers, that rosette dies. Now, with yuccas, because it sends up, when it starts flowering, it sends up all these baby rosettes around it, nobody ever notices. If you ask most people if yucca rosettes die after flower, 99.9% .9 of people will say no. That would be the wrong answer. But they just don't notice the fact that it has lots of things on there. But, so not all yuccas are the same. Now, what was really interesting with agaves, um, back several years ago, agaves have another close relative called Manfredas. And we have some on the back side over here. Manfredas is a little native, uh, the plant's about this tall. They're succulent, they're rubbery, they have no spines, but they have purple spots on the leaves. And so we began the first program of crossing agaves and manfredas together with two ideas. One, we thought agaves have no purple in their background, none. So we crossed it and we were able to get purple spots into the agaves. We also softened the spines and we got rid of the fact that they die after they flower because manfredas don't. Manfredas, they flower, next year they flower again, next year they flower again. So all of our crosses which we name mangaves, and that's what you see here. So these are crosses between the two plants. These up 20 years ago, these none of these actually existed. So we've been able to take those spots and concentrate them to the point that the plant actually looks purple in many cases, or has all series of spots and colors and just crazy stuff. So that is a completely man-made, everything here is that new man-made category. So now, some of these, most of these are tropical. Most of these are not gonna live inside. We've got maybe, maybe eight that live outside. Now, when they flower outside, it's a, the spike's not as tall, it's sort of intermediate. It's probably a eight to 10 foot spike. The next year, it, the plant just starts reflushing again from the ground, and instead of one plant, you'll have 15 or 20 of them. And then the next year, it comes fully back. So it's, it lost the, the, what we call monocarpic, which means flower and die. We lost that trait in the first generation, which was actually really cool, and got this incredible color offering. So there's some really neat things going on with with agaves. And agaves had pretty much been relegated to Southwest. And 
uh, we were certainly one of the very early places uh, being inspired by the work of J.C. Ralston, who grew, like I say, a couple at the Arboretum, to really let's just see what the possibilities are with agaves. We're all told they won't grow here. And turns out they will grow fine if you put them in the right place and select the right one. Please repeat about the Manfreda. Does it die back in the winter? Uh, Manfredas, there are some that are completely deciduous and there are some that are evergreen. They're not all the same. So it depends on what parent you use, which Manfreda parent is to do these die back or not. So this year, for example, let's look right here. Actually, uh, for those that don't know Manfredas, here are Manfredas. These are non-purple spotted ones, but these are Manfredas. That's a, that's a mature size on that Manfreda. So here is a mangavi. This was crossed with an evergreen species of, of Manfreda and agave of Atifolia, the big one there. That came through 11 degrees. Now what did it do? It stayed evergreen, but it got some of the old foliage got burned on it. So during the winter, a late winter, it doesn't look great, but it's come right back. Uh, here's another one right here. The main varieties called whale's tail. That came through 11 degrees pretty good. It got you know, Lucy a little bit of burn on there, a little bit of burn there, but they reflush so fast in spring. I think that's pretty amazing. So it this is we're very young in breeding these. This is this is a very new project. We've got uh, we put in another 250 seedlings this year from our crosses last year. So. Where we can go with these is just, we're not even close to. <coughs> Do you trim away the dead part at any, any yeah. time? Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. when we have time. It's just a matter of us getting around to it. We, we have so many of these, it takes us a while to get through the whole collection. I planted Bad Hair Day. Yes, uh-huh. It flowered and the plant died. Okay. A, puff, a couple of pups remained, but that was about it. Yeah, so what it does, it will die back to the flower stem, to the base of the flower stem, and then it should reflush from there. Bad hair day is right on the edge of being hardy here. So I wow. think that is probably more due to the winter. Okay. If you'd have had a milder winter, I think it would have reflushed really nice. Right, it's really yeah, we lost our bad hair day, which had not flowered. Uh, okay. Yeah, 11 degrees is right at the edge of that. I think that's probably going to be a good 8B. Plant. We had an 8 a winter. <laughs> Great question. Other questions? Cool. I hope you walk around, see a lot of the uh, amazing agaves that are here. And if you have the chance to come back tomorrow for Patrick's demo, it's it's pretty crazy. It's gonna you'll be amazed at the amazed at the different types of thread that come out of agaves. He's got some thread already made and gonna have a Martha Stewart type day. It's <laughs> it's really cool. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.